So uh, a couple of weeks ago, I think it's a, f a fortnight, we looked at the first dimension. Um, I'll recap quickly and then we'll go to the next one. Uh, see how far we can uh, cover this. So uh, from 39, Luke chapter 2, the Bible says, So when they had performed all these, thing, all these things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. So 40 was one of our key texts. The child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. 40, 40, 41. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days, as they returned, as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother did not know it. But supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him amongst, among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now, so it was that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. 47. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke. 51. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom, in stature, and in favor with God and men. Buana asifiwe. Now, um, the last time we looked at the first dimension of grace being, for those who are not in, we say the first dimension is the dimension of the wilderness, the dimension of the wilderness. The Bible here, in, those, in, the, in, the, in the text we have read, it begins with Jesus Christ, the Bible says, there was favor upon him. And the word of God used there, the, the word grace, as I said, is charis. And it also ends with 52 and saying, and the favor of God was upon him. And so we try to break down, how does favor appear? How does favor or how does grace look like? David uses the word favor. How does grace look like? And I began by giving you a story for those who are here, for those who are in I see some people who are not here, so I'll repeat that story quickly to recap. Uh, I gave a story of a friend of mine uh, at the university who gave me a story that really moved me. And I said that that gentleman comes from a really well-off family. But he told me a story in passing of how his father took him to a very remote area, a very remote school in West Pocot, dry area. And the school had scarcity of food. Remember, he comes from a rich family. But the father took him to a very remote school. And one day the father found him. He came at, in school uh, abruptly and found him eating boiled um, wild vegetable. Toto. Remember Toto? And he said, he told me, and my father looked at what, what, what I was carrying and up to date he told me he has never commented. Remember the story? He said, I am now an old man. My father has never commented about, this, about the vegetable that I was carrying. And the father did not, you know, naturally perhaps, as a father will have said, let me move him. From what I have seen, my son is suffering. The father never commented and left him there for another five years. <laughs> that father must have been a tough one. Okay? But brethren, look here. The father knew what he was doing. The father knew what he was doing. The father's eyes were upon his son. He knew what he was doing. And I said, 
when you are a believer, there are two extremes which you will go through. You struggle, you struggle through two extremes. The first extreme usually is where you begin with, why me? Why me? Okay? You go through some stuff and you say, why me? Why not other people? Why me? Okay? There is a movie I, I, I advocate, I don't know whether I've ever advocated, it's called uh, Fiddler on the Roof. Fiddler on the Roof. If you have not watched that movie, you better go watch. How many have watched it? Yes, the Fiddler. Yeah, only one person. What do you watch, church? Which movies do you watch? <laughs> if you haven't watched that one, then you are here to begin watching movies. For those who love poetry and literature, it's a good movie. It's called Fiddler on the Roof. So that guy, the major actor, is called Raptavia. Raptavia being Jewish, uh, on one day he wakes up in the morning, the busy day, and he finds his horse is sick, is limping, and it is the only source of income. And so he goes to God and tells God, look here, my father, I know that we are chosen people, but can you choose someone else? Okay, so why me? Why me? So in life, in the wilderness, you will go through why me, as David was, why me? Who am I? To who am I? You look back in life and you realize that that wilderness was for your benefit. It was a testament that the hand of God was upon you. And so that gentleman that I gave a story about was so beneficial in our lives because of the training that the father allowed him to go through. Buana and our parents, for some wisdom, always allow certain children to go through certain tough times than others. Hello? Am I talking to anybody here? Perhaps I'm talking to Elder Aliso. Elder Aliso one, one day told me that his mom would always tell him, we when he spoke with Chunga Otaribika. Some of us, our parents who are so close to us, hello? Eyeball to eyeball. They either knew that this guy, if allowed some space, hello, or they knew that there's something in this child that allows certain form of training than his siblings. They saw some anointing in you that was missing in the other brethren. So they gave you some fires. You know, they gave you some, fire, some wilderness some screws, they tightened, and you'll ask yourself, why are my parents so tough on me and not my sibling? I sat with the pastor uh, when they were in Dar Salaam, him and my wife and his daughter, uh, Karen. I don't know that she's here. Uh, we, this one evening, we became just wild. We went around hotels at night, okay? We we're just feeling like young people. So we were hoping hotels and restaurants. We went home at midnight, found mom sleeping. And in one of the hotels he was sitting, and the girls were asking pastors questions, my wife and the daughter, Karen. And I remember Karen telling pastor, but you know what, dad? You were so tough on me, unlike my brothers. Why were you always tough on me? Hello? It is the grace of God, brethren. Wilderness, do not mistake wilderness that you may have been forsaken. It's not being forsaken. Wilderness, brethren. You should be able to interpret it rightly. Wilderness is a testament that the hand of God is upon you. And when David looked back and realized that, in Psalms 139, he says, God, 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 why, who am I that you always think about me like that? Who am I that your hand is upon me? Who am I? In earlier Psalms, David is crying. He keeps on crying and lamenting. He says, God, why, you, why have you allowed your enemies to prevail against me? And he complains. And he complains, his father, raise an evil man to confront this person. He says, why are they pursuing me every day like a bird in the mountains? In 139, he gets the revelation. He says, oh, Lord. There was a reason why you allowed me to go through this. And I gave you illustrations in the Bible. 
Christ himself in the Bible says that while he was in the flesh, while he was in the flesh, the Bible says that he prayed prayers and supplications in tears and cries. Hebrews 5. Christ, the Bible says that he prayed tears vehemently before God in tears and cries. And he says that he suffered these things. He says he suffered for the sake of obedience. That he became obedient because of the, of, the, of the suffering that he went through. Christ our Lord. And God says that his hand was upon Christ. That my grace was upon him. Brethren, I know you don't understand this. But just the mere fact that Christ left heaven and came to earth was too much humility. Was too much suffering. Brethren, it was too much suffering. You know, I also watched um, a documentary of um, uh, Harry, Harry and Meghan. It's on Netflix. How many have watched it? Harry and Meghan, uh, these are royals, right? Harry is a prince. And so, uh, I'm, for some reason, I'm just interested with the royal family, royal staff. And in that documentary, Harry, having forsaken royal duties and left with his wife to Canada, as it were, because he'd forsaken his duties, royalty, he's become a common man, the royal family or the government of Britain withdrew security from him. And in one of the episodes, all he's talking about and lamenting about is how the family had withdrawn security. And I was wondering, Mam Chungaji, of all the things, why is he concerned about security? But you know what? He's a royal guy. There are things that my children, because of the way they have been raised, perhaps in urban centers, if they went to the village, they will feel so shocked because that's not their life. Christ leaves his throne, comes to the earth, is a lot of humility. And not just that. The Bible says he was even hungry. Remember there's a time he went to look for wild fruits? Remember? This one is the Lord. He has left the throne and the streets of gold. He's looking for Nduma, not Nduma, Mapera, you know. You know Mapera? Wild fruits. And it was not even the season. He was hungry. I don't know whether you're getting the picture here. You can imagine my son looking for Mapera, me, and I'm a human being. The Bible says that two fathers who are wild, okay? You know how to good give, give good gifts. Imagine my son looking for wild fruit because he's hungry. Mchungaji, you can't allow that, can you? But Christ looked for Mapera. He was in the wilderness. But through that period, the Bible said here, the grace of God was upon him. God is strange. God is strange. Same with Joseph, our brother Joseph. He goes through prison, through the dungeon, and the Bible says, and the hand of God was with him, Joseph. So that is what we looked at last week. And just in recapping that one, I'm just reminded, when you struggle between the why me and who am I, remember one thing, brethren, just one thing as we conclude that section. That when finally you come from that episode and you are a who am I? Be like Joseph. Remember, it was not us who made you go through that. It is not us. <laughs> Let me repeat that. It is not us, brethren, who made you go through that. If you have got any question, please, please take it to the Lord. Many of us, when you have gone through the fire, in the wilderness, you begin looking for people. And so and so did not help me. Hello? Hey, when I was, when I was, when I did not have a job, you know, you were the manager, you were the CEO. And brethren, God is so strange that when you are going through the wilderness, when you're going through the wilderness, sometimes and many times, even those guys who can help you do not even see you. Hello? They have got vacancies in their, in their office and they recruit other guys, and you are there, and they don't see you because your season is not done. So when the season is done, brethren, 
do not remind us. Don't remind us. You know, you may be hungry, right? And you find someone, you are hungry not because you are fasting, you are broke. And someone is eating a full chicken and leaving flesh on the chicken. You understand how those Nairobians eat? I'm speaking like a lawyer. Please don't blame us. Your season will come. Be like Joseph say, you, 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 it is not about you. God sent me here to save lives. Hello? Let's go to the next one. So we are done the wilderness. So understand the wilderness. And appropriate it properly. And actually, uh, the Bible says that it is better for you to carry your yoke in your youth. It says it's, it is better for you to carry the yoke in your youth. The Bible says that. I have never understood. But brethren, if God can allow you to go through the wilderness in your youth, praise the Lord. There are certain yoke you don't want to carry in your old age. Hello? So if you are a young, if you are a young man in this place, you're going through wilderness, have perspective. It is better at your age. You know, sometimes I go through town here and I find old men, Elder George. I know you see them. And I see them pushing mukokoteni, people in their 60s, 70s, pushing mukokoteni. And it always hurts my heart. And I say, that man is carrying the yoke at the wrong time. You know, in the 60s, your energy is dwindling. Hello? Or you see them riding a bicycle on a hill. 60, 70 years. It's not, rec not the recreation of bicycle. Can you get it? It is a bicycle for food. Are you getting that? There's a difference. There's the riding of the bicycle for livelihood. You are carrying luggage. And there's the one who is ride for exercise. You find an old man in a, on a hill, 70 years, riding a bicycle. He doesn't even have gears. And I say, oh no. It's the wrong time. Anyway, we are done with that. Let's go to the next one. The next dimension of the grace of God is what we call time redemption. Time redemption. The Bible says, do everything redeeming the time for these are evil days. Now, in the text we have read, the Bible talks about, the story is about Christ having been left in the temple when he was 12 years old. How many of us have got 12-year-old children? Okay, or about that play. Okay, Ella, Lisa, yes, has. I thought, uh, Pastor Lisa, your daughter is 12 years old. 13. So let's say, uh, let's say uh, minus plus one. 13, 12. Okay. Now, this is the story. Christ has been left in the temple, and he has been left there for one major thing. He, did not, he was not left there because he was playing a game. No, he was left there because he chose to. Okay? And when the parents came back, the Bible says they found him listening and asking questions. Are you following the story? Now, let me ask the parents with 12-year-old children. How many of those parents here can testify that their children can stay one day listening to a listening to a broadcast or being trained on something. Just one day, not three days. Lift up your hand. Twelve year. Okay, there's no one day. How many can sit six hours being trained and taught from the pulpit the way I'm doing? Six hours, twelve year, none. Story short like this, brethren. One of the dimensions of grace is God being able to give you ears to hear like the learned. You desire things that your age mates don't desire. Hello? Your investment in time is different from your age mates. It's a dimension of grace. That your desire is years ahead of you. Christ was sitting with the elders asking questions at the age of 12 for three, for three days. It is not normal. It's a dimension of grace. So when the hand of God is upon you, brethren, he lets you desire things that are not always natural for either your age 
or your gender or your people, something like that. It's a dimension of grace. In other words, God was allowing Christ to listen to things that were so way ahead of his time. And our parents who cared about us allowed us to go through that. I'll give you a story. Uh, we, went for, um, we went for a retreat. Uh, by a brick street, uh, four of us, four, five of us. And we lived in a very good house in Arusha. And I remember uh, Elder George, uh, in the house we were living in, uh, this guy had beautiful ornaments. And one of the things he had in the house was the what you call, is it Ba or a Juala? It's called a Juala. It's called what? Ba, it's called what? Ba, ba, a jua. You know a jua? There are things that pe people play bebels. Okay, ajua. It's very addictive. Okay, ajua. It's very addictive. And, and I don't know, Elder Juju was just reading my mind. I was standing there and looking at the ajua, ajua, the ajua thing in the house of that gentleman. And Elder Juju comes and asks me, hey, Brother Mlongo, do you know how to play this ajua? I said, no, I don't know. Okay, I'm just admiring it. I don't know how to play it. And he says, me too, I don't know how to play it. He says, he told me something very funny but very profound. He says, my dad never allowed us to play these games when we were young. And he told me something. He says, every time I see these kind of games, I always see my dad around me. <laughs> and I looked at him. I don't know whether he... I looked at him from the top of his soul to the bottom of his soul. Why? He spoke exactly what I went through in life. My dad never allowed us to play those games. I never understood. Those are your things, the things that other kids were playing. My dad never allowed us. He will kill you. You know those things that kids play like this? Up to date brethren. I'm not kidding. On my phone, I don't have any computer game on my phone. I don't have any. If there is any, my daughter has just uploaded. I don't play any computer game. It's not, I'm not saying so. It's, it's just the way I've been trained. Okay. And now with hindsight, we understood why. Our parents were redeeming time for us. Their hand was upon us. They knew the easiest way to lose time to spoil your children is to allow them entertainment early. Hello? They knew entertainment kills vision. And small children don't understand how to balance entertainment. That's why as parents we are called upon to regulate screen time for children. Just one thing, that you don't let entertainment overtake them. That they can invest their time in other things. And so, brethren, we see in this text, God is redeeming time for Christ. And he does that through many ways. The first one is that he makes your heart to be amenable to people who are older than you. Hello? When the grace of God is upon you, he makes your heart love people or you enjoy the company of people who are older than you. Or you, they are wiser than you. You know, brethren, there's something we call in, in, in scriptures, we call the, the Rehobam, uh, Rehobam, a mentality. You know the whole bomb? The whole bomb. The whole bomb. The whole bomb was a son of Solomon. Hello? And the story is, sorry, it's all about the whole bomb. The whole bomb takes over from his father, Solomon. Okay? And he inherits the kingdom when it is at the ultimate of success. Okay? Remember, like the person who took after Kibaki, the economy was booming. There was peace all over in Israel. There was wisdom galore. And Rehoboam comes to the throne. And the first day he becomes the king, the people come to him and tell him, long live the king. We have come, king, to ask you for one favor. King, your father, Solomon, when he was a king, they tell him, he gave us a lot of burden and yoke. Okay, for obvious reason. There was construction of the temple, right? 
So there was a lot of taxation and too much work, like now in the country, Kenya. Okay. Pasavia, guys, Pasavia, Pasavia. Me, I'm in Dar es Salaam, me, I'm on TV. It's our wilderness, right? A time will come when there will be fruit, right? Now, Jeroboam, so they asked Jeroboam for favor. Things have improved, uh, Mr. President. Now, remove some of these punitive taxes. Okay? We now no longer have enemies. So we are finished constructing the temple. So, lessen the burden. A fair request, right? It's a fair request. And he says, uh, being a wise man, he says, now do this, guys. Come back after three days and I'll give you an answer. Okay. And Robam goes to, the, to his counselors. The Bible says he went to two categories of counselors. He went to the older people, those who counseled his father. Okay. People like, you can imagine Nathan was there, Abadia was there, and other people were there. And he asked them, how shall I respond to those guys? And the older people tell him, my son, king, what they're asking is a valid request. When they come back for the answer, tell them actually you're going to concede their demand because there's no need for these taxes. Okay. And he goes to the next group, the guys you grew up with. Hello? Uh, the teens, teenagers. Okay? Majama. You know them. And ask Kina Jemo, Jemo, what should we do? And Kina Jemo tell him, uh, you know what? When they come back, tell them that you're going to double. Because you're the boss, you're going to double the burden. Okay? And actually tell them that, you know what? Tell them that, you know, the waist of my father was more like my small finger. He's trying to tell them, you know what? I am bigger than my father. Okay? And the worst story, for me, I, it always hurts my heart. He takes that advice of his Kinajemo. When people come after three days, he tells them, look here, guys, I am going to double the taxation. I am going to double the burden. And when the people heard that, the Bible says, their hearts sank and said, do we have a share in the house of David? And say, everyone to his tent. And they left. And that explains why from that day, the kingdom of Israel was torn into two. Rehoboam remained with only two tribes out of the 42. Only two. No, out of the 12. Only two. Smaller tribes. The others were taken by uh, uh, the other guys, uh, son of Nebat. But brethren, the story here is that Jeroboam committed one sin. Having that constant desire to hang with people of your age, your thinking, your caliber. It's not a good thing. When God wants to promote you, to accelerate you, when your father wants to accelerate you, he gives you opportunity to hang with the people who will file you. The Bible says that as an iron files another, so does a man sharpen the countenance of another. It's, it is a sign. It is, it is a dimension of grace when the hand of God is upon you. So brethren, in other words, if you begin seeing you attracting people who are not of your league, thank God for it. But if you are attracting only your folk around you, begin ask yourself questions. People of your type. Kina Jemo, Kina Mlosh. If you can hear someone call Mlosh around me, ah, ah. Hello? You want, I want to hear people call him Mr. Mulongo. Hello? Eh, eh. Kina James, not Jemo. You know Jemo translates to James afterwards, right? You become Deno for a while, then after a while you become Dennis. If you are in 40s and people are still calling you Deno and Jemo, Hello? So that's how God works. But also very important, as I, as I finish that section, is, is, is just how the grace of God enables you to manage your time in the area of entertainment. 
I think I've said this one in the past. But one of the signs of grace is that grace kills your desire for time-wasting stuff. Even as an adult. Brother, I'm saying this from the bottom of my heart. Um, you may be different. For me, things about series, they do not bother me at all. One has a few way. I sometimes watch, but I don't miss it. Hello? Or I don't miss Manchester and Liverpool playing. I don't miss it. When I find it, I'll watch. If I don't find it, I will not. Just, just, just how I was trained. And so, um, one aspect is that. And God comes and tells the Israelites, he says, I am going to get you out of Egypt to a promised land. But one thing I'm going to do for you is that I'm going to give you houses you never build, vineyards you never planted, wells you never dug. He's telling them that I am going to accelerate you in the, this period and you recover the time you lost. It's a sign of grace. Time redemption. Time redemption. And so God gives a few examples of how people have redeemed time. And one of those guys is actually David himself. God takes David from looking after the sheep and, 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 and cattle and brings him to play the harp for Solomon. Uh, sorry, for Saul. It wasn't for Saul, brethren. It was for David's benefit. God was training David how to be a king. Hello? He was saving time for him. David was from the village like me. There are some guys here, you, took, you take them to state house and you, you have seen some of our ministers who are, have you seen some of our ministers in this country? How they are behaving? Have you seen them? They never got that opportunity to live with the kings. They are still villagers in their heads. So they are embarrassing the president. Have you seen them? I don't want to mention names. But there are so many in this government. There are so many. There are so many, David, with a ship mentality. So God gets you out of the village to come and live with Saul for a while because he's preparing you. He's, he's redeeming time for you to learn how kings eat, how kings dress, how kings speak. It's grace of God. God gets Joseph from his brethren and brings him to be the to be the PS, to be the personal secretary of Potiphar. You know, Potiphar who was Potiphar was the prime minister. And and Joseph is observing. He's observing how the Potiphar's are living, how they invite visitors, how they dress. And when God gets him from prison to become the prime minister, he doesn't struggle. He had observed. How to hold a knife, how to speak to people. That is God. He's redeeming your time. So He gives some people who are ahead of you to train you. Sometimes it's painful. You look at yourself and you're wondering so, what do I do in this case? Because you don't know how to speak, you don't know how to dress. You know, one of the things we did, brethren, when we, you've seen me with my, uh, my, my, my niece, the one who comes with us in this church, Angel. She lives with us. When Angel came to live with us from the village, she joined when she was in class five. My wife and I decided not to take her to a good school. Okay? She was so raw. You know? She was very raw. She didn't understand English. Okay? You know again what I'm talking about? The schools where I come from, English, we talk in mother tongue. People from Muranga, people from Muranga here? A pastor here. I don't know why Muranga guys, they speak very bad English. But, <laughs> but I understand them. And so, our pastor was, our pastor is, no, he's, he was born in town. Not really. so, so Angel comes to live with us and, and, and we take her to, um, 
a slum school in, in, in Kawangware, okay? Just across the fence where we live. We were living just across in Loretta that side. And, and people were asking us, can you get her good school? Some of our friends who were very free with us, can you get your niece a good school? But we knew what we were doing. We knew what we were doing. It would have been a very big culture shock to take her to Uthir Genesis from the village. She didn't even know how to use toilet nicely. You guys, you're getting the story, right? She had to go through some fire and hang with the guys in the slums. You know those rough, rough edges guys, eh? Who don't speak Swai, who don't speak English. They speak Sheng and, you know. And she went through that culture shock for two years. And we're observing. You know, one of the things we learned one day is that we were discovering that the, the bread in our house was not lasting. Bread, bread and, and yogurt. So we buy bread and bread the next day there's no bread. So one day, I think my wife was observing bread and, and yogurt. It's, you know, we realized that she was carrying half a bread every day to school and packets of yogurt. And so my wife asks her, because she doesn't eat a lot at home. She asks her, why do you always carry a lot like that? She says, you know, I, you know, I'm hungry. But we came here from the teachers that she was under siege, you know, by, how do you call those guys, those who bulldoze others? Um, sorry, how do you call them? Bullies, bullies. She had a bully, one girl, who had been given appetite. So for her, the only thing she desired from Angel is bring me or I kill you. Okay. So Angel would carry half loaf and two packets of your God. But you know what? Today she's a fine lady. You should see her. I should bring her next time she's in school. She's so well-spoken, well-mannered, elite. But you know what? It is a training, right? So she's been allowed to go through the process. And so when God wants to redeem time like that, he lets you hang with people like, like, like Justice Kula at the back. Please don't be just passing him. Say hi. Speak to him one word. Okay, get some of these things rubbing on you. You know, it's a good thing. And the final one. No, I'll, I'll not do the final one. I've done so much time. Shall we, shall we pray? So one day I'll do the, 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 the last one. And so, Father, as we sang this morning, uh, we are just amazed of who you are to us. Of the things that you do for us. As your servant David said, who are we? Or who am I? That your grace, your grace can be upon us. You've saved us from the mire. And you have sat us with kings. Delivered us from destruction. From perdition. That we are called children of the most high God. Lord, this knowledge is just too much for us to comprehend. It's too much for us. That since we were born, Lord, in our mother's womb, you ordained us to be those who will partake of eternal life. Because your hand has been upon us. In the wilderness, Lord, you did not forsake us. You never left us. You didn't leave sin to have dominion over us. But we have overcome the evil and the devil. Although he came to kill and destroy, Lord, you have saved us as a remnant. We are thankful. We are thankful. We are thankful. We are thankful. For those who are going through the wilderness, Lord... May your grace be sufficient. May your wisdom be sufficient. Let out of the eater come something sweet. That there shall be an occasion for testimony. Out of that. And so may God give you grace, my brother and sister. May God give you grace. With eyes closed, brethren, if you are going through any wilderness, just shoot up your hand. We pray for you. With eyes closed, if you are going through any wilderness, thank you. Thanks for those hands. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As we are preaching here, we're speaking here, there's grace of God. 
Father, by the miracle working hand, you've seen those hands. Wilderness is not permanent. So, Lord, let my brother and that sister will raise their hand, Lord. That they will give a testimony. There will be those who comfort masses and generations to come. Let something sweet come of that pain. Let be the comforters of this nation. Raise them to be the princes in this land. And kings in this land. And beyond the borders. Let them be Davids. And saying that God, who am I that you taught me this? So let that pain not be permanent or final. So Lord, we ask for grace. For wisdom. For understanding in our brethren. And for those who have lost time, Lord, give them houses they never built. Quicken their steps. Father, we repent for time wasting. We repent for hanging around things that are free for us. You ask to have mercy, Lord. Have mercy on us. And accelerate us, my Father. So, Lord, we receive the house we never built. Wells we never dug. Vineyards we never planted. For you are miracle working, Father. Let this be our testimony. Let this be a testimony, Lord. So, Lord, that's our prayer. How wonderful is your name. How marvelous is your name. How gracious is your name. So blessed be your name. In Jesus' name. So we appreciate our Lord. Amen. Amen. Pastor, welcome.